Welcome to Noon Hour Slides from the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery. We're located on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional lands of the Blackfoot, Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We pay our respects to First Nations and Métis ancestors and reaffirm our relationship with one another. We gratefully acknowledge funding from the City of Moose Jaw, Sask Arts, Sask Culture, Saskatchewan Lotteries, Canada Council for the Arts, Canadian Heritage, and the Government of Canada. I'm Vincent Hotelling, the Administrative Assistant here, and I'm here to welcome you to today's presentation. Carl Rasmussen is here to talk about some interesting destinations right here in Saskatchewan. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, initially, my husband, Chris, was supposed to help out with the presentation. However, within the last month or so, he's changed careers and he's now working in Regina and his lunch hour is not as flexible as mine is. So he sends his regrets uh, and maybe the next one uh, he might be able to join us as well. So I will do my best uh, showing off some of our pictures here. Uh, um, our main uh, point of this vacation was to go to uh, actually Prince Albert National Park in the north. Uh, however, with the dates that we had available for holidays for us, uh, that wasn't possible because everything was booked up. So we changed gears and we decided to explore some closer to home places in the south. Uh, on my map, I've got Moose Jaw circled right here. Uh, what we started off with was heading west down the Trans-Canada to Swift Current. And then we went south to Lac Pelche uh, Regional Park, which was a very first for us. We'd never stayed there before. Whoops, now I'm going to go going too fast here. Woohoo. There we go. So this was our campsite here. Um, having never been to this regional park before and really only seeing things on a map, um, it was a little different when we got there. There are a lot of seasonal campers here um, and our site looks kind of nice and secluded. However, uh, like just beyond over this way, there was a whole row of camps campers over there. So um, while we had a really great site, um, we kind of picked it because it was the easiest to back in. There was a road in the front here and then we just backed in. Um, it was actually a really great site for us because it was kind of a little bit more more private. Um, this was the view out the backside of the, the campground uh, site we had. Uh, there was a little bit of a gravel road, but this was just over the other side of that. So some very beautiful scenery there. Um, uh, this is looking pretty much straight south, just beyond the campsite. And just kind of south uh, east, I guess this direction would be here. So it was a little mowed area, uh, to a little road to get to the, the cottages that were nearby as well. Um, this is our look looking out uh, from our little tent uh, that we have for keeping the bugs out. And this is one of our cats. And I bring her up here uh, because we often will camp with our pets. Um, there's almost never a time we go camping without them. Uh, she's one of our three cats and she travels the best. Uh, she's also a senior and has some special dietary needs. So it's just easier for us to bring her with all our medications and whatnot. And she travels well and just loves it. Um, and you'll maybe see a few more of our pets a little bit later on here. Um, I should also kind of back up and mention this was the first week of August when we were going through one of those major heat waves. So um, we were very fortunate to have air conditioning in our trailer and the pets were very appreciative of that as well. Um, this is the view looking towards the lake from our campsite. So you can kind of see the rows of the trailers off here. Um, there's cars here and then there's more trailers back this way. Uh, but we did have a little peekaboo view of the lake, which was lovely. Uh, this is um, my husband Chris and my son Duncan uh, just playing some games behind the trailer there. Uh, we mainly sat in the shade during the day because it was so very hot, but in the evening we tried to get out and do as much as we could, so we played a lot of our outdoor games during that time. Uh, this is Chris and his dog Radar, one of our two dogs uh, in the lake. Uh, I learned that this was actually a, a spring fed lake. So um, it's always nice and fresh. The water was fairly warm. Um, I'm not a big swimmer, but even I went out there and had a little paddle around, which was very nice. Um, the park itself was established back in the 60s, I think around 64, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it's actually named after a local Métis man who settled there uh, before the 1900s. Uh, his name was Norbert Peltier. Um, and there's now about 300 cottages, a few beaches, and uh, quite a bit of uh, recreation goes on there pretty much all year round. Uh, of course, the focus is on summer. A lot of folks boating. Um, we had a few sea dews on the lake there. Um, it was very, very beautiful and calm most of the days we were there, uh, but you can still see that forest fire smoke in the sky. So we didn't get a lot of, you know, true sunsets while we were out, but it was still very beautiful and it kind of added a little bit to some of our pictures as you'll see as we go along through here. So I'm um, just looking down towards the cottage area on this one end of the lake. Um, and we were camped at the very south end of this lake here. So one of the docks. Uh, this is from uh, one of the cottage areas. You can see some on the far shore over here. Our camper was just kind of over this ways that way. There we go. 
um, it seemed very family focused. Again, this was our first time here. We didn't know a lot about the area other than what we could kind of find online. We didn't know a lot of folks who had been here before either. So um, I would definitely recommend it. The beaches were nice and sandy. Uh, there's my kids out on one of the diving platforms and they really enjoyed that. Uh, again, it was fairly clean water and a good temperature. So that always makes for a good paddle on a hot day. Uh, this was the morning that we ended up leaving. Uh, we went for a little walk again before the heat of the day kind of caught up with us and found some little sunflower looking things on the shore. Uh, some of the sea dews and these are the cottages that would be on the southwest corner of the lake. A few asters. Uh, the other nice thing that we uh, saw uh, and took part in was the mini golf that they have there. There's there's a full-size golf course as well, uh, but having the kids along, they, they enjoy playing mini golf. So um, this was something that we did. Uh, it was fairly shady, as you can see there. So that was, even though it was a hot day, it was still fairly cool for us to, to go and play. Um, it was wonderful. I understand they actually do mini golf tournaments here on a regular basis. So if you're in the area, it might be something to uh, take part in. Uh, this is one of the other beach areas. This is sort of in the center of the lake. Uh, there's also a little uh, cafe bar and uh, convenience store. I think it's called Plancy's near this, this spot here. So another nice sandy place to go and paddle. They've got some docks and, and whatnot there. Uh, somebody's done a paddle boarding behind. Our wonderful Canada geese taking part in the lake as well. And then we decided to continue on uh, south and uh, we were heading down to Grasslands National Park. Uh, I've never been there before, uh, neither had Chris. Uh, my kids will sometimes go to the east block with their dad camping, but neither had been to the west block, which was where we were heading. And I, I feel that more people are familiar with the east block, perhaps because it's a little closer to Moose Jaw. Um, but uh, the west block is lovely. And uh, if you're looking for a true way to escape from um, technology and online things, this is the place to go. Um, so I'll just advance the slide here. This is a map of the west block. Uh, the village of Valmarie is just kind of over this ways over here. Um, and uh, it's a paved road all the way there. And then you access the park by going around and coming this way and then you actually come in from the north. So once you hit the border of the park, the road is actually gravel. It's in fairly good shape, although it is corduroy in quite a few places. So we had a few things to pick up off the trailer floor once we arrived at our campsite. Um, and I'll maybe mention this a little bit later on, but this road is also part of the eco tour drive that goes through the park. Um, and it's about 20 kilometers long just through the park borders. So we were headed to the Frenchman Valley campground, which is right about here. So a little more than halfway through um, and coming into the park, you descend quite a steep valley which is the Frenchman River Valley and you can see in the middle here um, and it's very dramatic and unfortunately it was quite overcast as well as smoky that day so we probably didn't get the full effect uh, what you might get on a clear day um, but it was still gorgeous and um, I'm originally from Manitoba in a parkland area so I'm used to trees all the time this was quite a bit different and I mean I've lived in Saskatchewan here in the south for quite a while but uh, it still was quite awe-inspiring to see almost the complete lack of trees so uh, very, very gorgeous and almost severe, I would say. Uh, this is overlooking our campground and our trailer is this one right here. So as you can see, there's very little uh, shrubberies and growth that there's a few uh, like buffalo berries kind of scattered around the edges here. Uh, but otherwise, it is very open and uh, it's, it can be quite harsh, especially in the heat of the day. Uh, so again, we were quite fortunate to have our air conditioning. Here's our trailer. Uh, it's windy nearly all the time in grasslands, we found out. Uh, so we had brought one of our windscreens for our tent, which was very helpful. Um, we didn't leave our awning out on the trailer for long, but we found our tent uh, did stay up quite well, uh, the gazebo, just with having it anchored in. Um, again, you can kind of see some of the, the trees that are back here. I believe these were planted. Uh, but they're not something that just grow just anywhere like that in the middle of the open prairie. This was kind of neat. Uh, each campsite uh, was recently electrified and I think these are something that was left over from before. Uh, this is a lantern post. Uh, we didn't need our lantern because we had our electricity, although we did have it along with us anyway. Uh, so each campsite has one of these, which is very nice. Um, I also took this picture for a few reasons. You can see the wooden fence in the background here. There are active herds of bison in this park. So this is to help keep them out of the campground. Um, there are passageways for people to go through, um, but the bison in theory cannot come 
and visit us. Uh, the other reason I took this is to kind of show some of the, the services, and I'll use that word rather loosely here. Um, there is no major source of water in the park. So there is a small um, water station, uh, not far from where we were camped in the campground there, mainly for personal drinking bottle size uh, containers. Uh, if you are bringing in water to the park, they ask that you actually fill up at the Val Marie campground. Um, I will also say that some of the tastiest water I think I've ever had in my journey so far in this province, they have excellent tasting water there. Um, so we did fill up our tanks uh, before we came to the park here, just so we'd have that. Um, and these are the washroom facilities. And there are, I think there were three or four very clean pit toilets. Um, they actually were pressure washed every morning. So they were nearly spotless. There was almost no smell, which made my daughter very pleased because she is not a big fan of pit toilets. Um, and then just beyond, uh, this is the Cooley Center. And it's actually like a cooling down station. So it's a big shaded area. It's not air conditioned, but it is substantially cooler. There's a concrete floor and it's made of rock. So it is quite cool. Uh, they also have Wi-Fi there and there's usually a park interpreter on site. So if you need some questions answered, that sort of thing, because you are so remote, um, there's someone usually there during the daytime. And they also do some of their, their evening programs out of this location as well. So quite a nice setup. Um, my kids playing catch here. Again, you can just kind of see uh, who was coming to this campground. Um, there were a few trailers for sure, but I'd say by and large, most of the people that were coming to this area were tenters. Um, most did not stay as long as we did. We were there for four full days. Um, most were overnighters or they would spend two days there. So just kind of interesting. Uh, this is a replica Red River cart that's near the Cooley Center. Uh, just kind of a neat little, little nod to the history of the area. There's a lot of Métis folk uh, here. Um, this is one of the Richardson's ground squirrels from the, the campsite. Um, my children affectionately named him Kevin. Uh, not to be confused with an actual prairie dog or gopher, the Richardson ground squirrel is quite a bit smaller and very common and it's probably what most of us would call a gopher. Uh, they are related but they are very different species as well. Um, because it was so hot and it was in the middle of this drought, um, we did leave some water out for him. We felt bad, probably not good, but uh, that's what we did anyway. Um, here's our dogs watching gopher TV. Again, this was in the morning before the heat of the day kind of came. Um, they were, they were, they're senior dogs. They don't have a lot of get up and go at this point, but they did find uh, all the Richardson ground squirrels quite fascinating to, to watch scurrying around the campground. And then one morning we came out and little Kevin had actually made his way under the flap of our tent and was out sitting in our screen gazebo. So uh, we did chase him off there before we let any of the pets outside that morning. Um, it was quite windy, so we did have to weight the edges of the uh, tent down at one point, uh, which was also kind of interesting because we had done a bit of reading. Uh, I guess there are hundreds and hundreds of teepee rings uh, in this park and the area. Many archaeological finds have been made of uh, Indigenous people's um, settlement and uh, travels through the area, so we kind of felt akin, if you will. Uh, we were using these rocks down in, in, not that we were making a teepee ring, but it was kind of a reminder of the people that had come before us. Uh, this is my son looking off to the northwest. Uh, there is a trail that runs up sort of above the campground up on a butte, and it's got some really nice views of the river down below. Uh, there's also a little viewing area here near a picnic site, and uh, way off in the distance we could spot one of the bison. So this was a good deal uh, a, a distance away from where we were. Uh, we did actually see another one on a trail, um, but again, he was way off in the distance. Uh, uh, another day we did see the herd, but they were so far away our binoculars almost couldn't pick them up. It wasn't for like the little swishing of tails every now and then, that we probably wouldn't have noticed them. Just kind of a wider shot of the area there from that trail above the campground. And uh, this is what we were calling the yellow grass road. So we were all in the Wizard of Oz mode. Um, we started at the top of the hill um, on the other side with our campground. We went over the hill and then this kind of snakes its way down to the creek area. So it's a very nice walk, very easy train to, to navigate there. Um, we were told to watch for rattlesnakes, of course, because this is prime habitat for them. Um, and especially to stay away from uh, being up close to these large rocks. So my son being a snake lover, of course, gets really close and actually found a little piece of discarded skin from one of their sheds. Uh, we did not see any rattlesnakes at all during our entire trip. I think it might have even been too hot for them. Uh, but it was neat to see this and uh, kind of know that their presence is there, even if we didn't see them. Uh, so this was, uh, I think, our first night here because it was kind of overcast again with that smoke in the air. You can see the dogs are panting, so it, it's still warm, but instead of being 37 degrees, it's only 28 here, so uh, still fairly, fairly warm. Uh, this is, again, looking down at that pathway that walks along the uh, riverbed there. 
um, kind of getting closer to the campsite again. Uh, nothing is really growing here. Then a little bit of sage and prairie grass. Uh, we, there was a fire ban on, so this was our campfire for our entire trip. So we did have a little bit of a warm glow. Um, and here are some actual gophers, or these are the black tail prairie dogs, as they're properly called. Um, they are quite endangered. Uh, grasslands is one of the preserves that actually has a fairly large population. They do have ups and downs with disease, I understand. There's different um, illnesses that can affect them. Uh, so at different times, visitors are asked to stay away and not disturb them. Um, along that eco tour drive through the park, there's actually two really good opportunities to get out of your vehicle, walk down a short path, and there's sort of a viewing area where you can see these colonies. And it is really fascinating you know you see the odd gopher you think of them as a pest perhaps out in the farm but to watch their interactions and in their community it, it really is quite fascinating this was on the eco tour uh, drive we went further past our campground um, and there are little remnants of the settlers and the ranchers who had been in this area before the park was created so i thought this was neat it had some old pieces of wood going up through the the barbed wire there and i like that the big knot had kind of fallen out and there was a hole sort of like a spyglass there um, and this i think it's a piece of sage a sagebrush that's grown up and through quite gnarly looking almost halloween-esque so um, was just kind of a really cool little reminder of the people that had come before. Um, I like this picture just because it almost looks like a prairie rainbow. We've got the kind of bluey purple in the sky there with the clouds and the golds and the browns and down to the lush green riverbed. Um, there were several places we saw deer along this road. Um, it was almost every every turn we saw another couple or a pair or a small herd. Um, this was a bit of a surprise. I know it's not the best picture but we did spot a couple of moose out here um, and then the river is just beyond those little uh, shrub willows there. Um, and I've heard after we'd gone on this trip that it's really not uncommon to see moose in the parks. So um, I found it a bit shocking because I always thought that they lived in the deep forests of the north, but uh, apparently they also like Grasslands National Park. This is a really cool little site and it's just down the road from the campground. This is what remains of the Larson Ranch. Uh, so uh, there's a little bit of a blurb on there, but uh, Mr. Larson actually came to the park uh, just after the 1900s and he worked at one of the biggest ranches, which we'll talk about just a little bit later here. And uh, he liked the area so much he wanted to do his own ranching. So he, he leased this land. Um, it's some incredible amount. Just bear with me for one second here. Uh, 32,000 acres, I believe, is what he leased um, originally, and uh, this was this, this huge property. So there's a couple of structures still remaining. Parks Canada does maintain them, uh, but you cannot go in them at this point. Um, so this one was sort of the largest um, house, if you will. Um, I believe that was what this, this purpose was for this one. Um, and then there's sort of a, um, I call it maybe more like a bunkhouse in the back there. And there's the bunkhouse. Um, it, it is caving in and deteriorating quite badly. Um, but it, it just fascinated me with the different textures and colors. Uh, here are some owl pellets on the roof. Uh, most of the shingles are gone. I just love the picture here. Um, I, I walked up close to it. I didn't have to really stand on my tippy toes or anything because it's got quite a low roof and just the, the rows of nails. I thought that was really cool. Uh, this is kind of peeking in through a hole in the wall. We did not actually enter either of these buildings. This is just holding my little cell phone up and, and snapping through the gaps. Um, there's an old door that's falling apart. I am quite interested in human history. I work at the Western Development Museum, so this is really just completely my bag. Um, I love looking at the angles and the textures and you know what, what hung on that hook, who made this hook, and, and for what reason. It's just, I like to get lost in my imagination sometimes. Um, I thought this was pretty with a little bit of lichen that's growing here and some of the original tar paper. Uh, my daughter is a cowgirl in training, so she decided she wanted to try roping the bull that's here. And then we took off down this little trail that goes down to the river. So this is a little bit down the ways uh, down the hill and looking back up at the homestead. And uh, this depression here, there's actually a couple of them, is uh, what remains of several of the old barns that Mr. Larson had built. Um, he built them into the hills so that they would keep the animals cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. And from the reading I've done, they had thatched roofs. So not unlike a Saudi for a, a human family, um, these were dug into the, the riverbanks. This is one looking from the river side back up. Um, and uh, I, I believe they were still standing up until not that long ago. And I think Parks Canada I just took them down as a safety issue. Um, I have seen some pictures of them, they were in very bad shape. So down we go, down continuing to the river here. And obviously the river is there because everything is green and lush. Uh, there were a few low places here where cattle were crossing. 
um, we're looking down the river itself. It wasn't that deep uh, right here, but I do understand in other places, um, people enjoy kayaking down this river. Um, this was also a bit of a surprise. I thought, oh, we're going to a deserty area. You know, it's going to be so, so dry. Well, there's a nice little leopard frog sitting on the bank and the thing hanging out of his mouth is actually a grasshopper lake. Uh, down the trail, it's about two kilometers in a loop. So it's it's not a nice little walk. It's not too steep or anything like that. Um, we've got some very dramatic trees here. It looked like there maybe had been a grass fire in the past. You can see there's sort of some charred um, bits on the tree. And I'm not sure if it was a natural fire or a controlled fire that Parks Canada may have lit. Um, but this is almost at the extreme end of the trail and just looking back up at the hill at the um, homestead there. Um, and then there's lots of pretty flowers everywhere. Uh, if you look for them, because a lot of them do blend in. Uh, lots of cacti. Um, and these are our ferrets who also travel with us. Um, I bring them up again because of the heat. Uh, ferrets like to live in cool places. They currently have a big cage in our basement. And we thought, oh gosh, what are we going to do? We don't have a ferret sitter. We'll bring them along. So this is their travel cage. We put them in the bathroom, which has a vent. And it also gets good circulation from the air conditioner. Um, so we really do have a furry menagerie that comes with us. And uh, they are just fun to be with. We did not let them out this trip because there actually are wild ferrets that live in Grasslands National Park. We didn't want to expose them to anything um, that they might actually pick up from their wild cousins. Uh, this is one of the, the big hikes that we did. And by big hike, I mean four kilometers. It was still very, very hot. Um, this is on the western side of Grasslands. And you actually have to leave the park and then drive back in going around by Val Marie. Um, this is a combination of two trails. The first is Eagle Butte, which is kind of this large piece right here. And the second part is 70 Mile Butte. And you may have heard of these. They are quite popular with hikers. Um, this trail, I would not say easy, um, but not overly difficult. It's just quite steep. And again, uh, with the temperature being so warm, we did take tons of water with us, which is something you need to be prepared for at all times in this park because there's no taps anywhere you can just fill up. So um, this is looking back down at the parking lot. We have not gone very far at all. And you can already see the uh, elevation that we've climbed here. Uh, some of the sweeping landscape, um, it's just really beautiful in a rugged way. Uh, there's my son again, and he's very near to Eagle Butte. And it is much higher and farther away than it actually looks here in this picture. Um, this is continuing on down the trail, and the Eagle Butte area is kind of just behind, off behind this edge of the picture at this point. Um, again, a few more little green things kind of popping up in unexpected places. And then we get to the trailhead. Uh, the two trails kind of connect almost like a figure eight. So you can do the first half just Eagle Butte and it's about two kilometers. And then the second half, 70 Mile Butte's another two. So we kind of did half of one and half of the other for a total of about four, um, which was a good distance for us in such weather. Um, there's also a few really cool interpretive signs. I think I've got a close up a little bit further on there. Um, a few bridges along the way crossing through these little gullies. Looking back again, that haze unfortunately is still in the air, although I would say this is probably one of the clearer days that we had. Um, there's one of the wonderful signs and they have a lot of nice little stories and pictures about what lives there and who came this way and that sort of thing. Um, I believe it is called 70 Mile Butte because it was visible from approximately 70 miles away. So used by uh, as a landmark for many, many generations of all kinds of people. Um, we are now going to go up this big windy switchback trail over here. And there's looking back again down into the flat landscape. Um, and to give you some perspective, the parking lot is around behind over here. So that's about where we've come so far. And again, distance wise, it's not really that far, but uh, in, in terms of the steepness, it, it was a little bit of a trek, that's for sure. Uh, just a few more pictures of the different flora and fauna, if you could call it that. There's a little bit of of greenery there. There were lots of grasshoppers and lots of bugs. Uh, we made it to almost the apex of the trail here. 70 Mile Butte is this large um, loaf looking piece behind everybody. Um, the dogs did make it. We stopped where we could find a little bit of shade. Sometimes that just meant a little hill that was sticking up. And we did bring along a dog water dish for them there. So they, they really enjoyed this and we took it at a slow pace. So just a really pretty area. And again, we were kind of happy that the haze had burned off a bit. Um, it's a big kind of erratic stone here on the top. Um, and then this is just where it, it almost drops right off here. So um, this is sort of coming down the other side. Uh, we were very fortunate to see a few hawks that were circling below us. So we really felt high to see that the hawks were patrolling and they were actually, uh, we were higher than they were. 
Um, this was another little spur trail. Uh, my husband and my son took over that way and my daughter and I retired. So we just thought we'd hang out here. Uh, this was neat. We found a survey pin at the top of this big uh, formation. And looking back down, there is some quartz and a few little seashell fossils that we put back after we took the pictures. They blended in so well, it was quite amazing. Um, and then coming down the other side, coming back towards the Eagle Butte area here, there's this little green oasis of poplar trees, very unexpected. Um, we've got some other sage and whatnot. This, I'm not sure the name of these little flowers, but I thought they looked like popcorn on the tops there. Um, magpie nest. Um, everything you could possibly imagine had footprints and, and nests in this little green spot here, probably because it was quite a distance to the next green oasis. Um, a lot of different types of soils and rock foundation formations in this area. This was almost like shale here. Um, and then just a little bit further along, it's one of these other pictures here, again, the greenery. Um, behind here, it almost looks like dinosaur skin. And in some places, it actually even looked like the area around um, uh, the clay bank brick plant. So a lot of that really clay soil too in places. This is on the way back to the campground down the Eco Tour Road and uh, again, the Frenchman River Valley. That's quite pretty. Um, the smoke was starting to come back in. We could almost see a wall coming. So we spent a little bit of time here just enjoying the greenery. It was a little bit cooler by now. The sun was a bit lower in the sky. Um, and then we walked over to what is left of the old 76 ranch. And there are some corrals that are still standing here. Um, this is kind of a neat place. Um, where's my little note that I made? Because I thought it was fascinating here. Um, so this was something that started back in, I think around 1910, 1911, something like that there. Um, and there was this uh, fellow who came through and he set up 10 separate estates between Moose Jaw and Calgary. And each of these estates had about 10,000 acres and then they could move the cattle kind of to and from. Um, so the old 76 ranch is still still standing here, what's left of the, the corrals anyway. Uh, this was where Mr. Larson had worked, the fellow who built that homestead we looked at earlier. And uh, I did enhance these pictures just a little bit to pop the color up a little bit more, but not by much. And you can see the haze that's really coming in. And it just was a, I don't want to say an eerie feeling to be here, but uh, it was definitely um, moody. And uh, it, it felt it felt right, I think. It, it was kind of that uh, ghostly reminder of the past and the troubles people may have had, the challenges they overcame. Um, and again, just I was really enthralled with all of the geometric patterns in, in the wood and the textures, what was left. Um, there was also a surprisingly large amount of uh, bird activity in this area here. Um, Grasslands has a lot of uh, shrike birds. I, I believe they are uh, northern shrike and loggerhead shrike. Uh, and these are the birds that are fairly small, but are um, sometimes considered quite predatory because they will often overcatch what they need to eat. So they'll stab what's left over on barbed wire or thorns and things like that and come back later. So uh, we did see quite a few of them around here. Um, one of the big discoveries I made, and I wasn't fast enough to get a picture, I saw a night jar, which is, I don't want to say totally nocturnal, but they, they do like to be more nocturnal than and active in the daytime. And it blended in with the wood so well, it was just sitting um, on one of the paddock uh, boards. And I didn't see it until I'd almost stepped on it. It was that close to it, and then it fluttered off. But I'd never seen one before, and I don't know if I'll ever see one again. Uh, but beautiful camouflage and kind of a, a rare bird, at least to see in the middle of the day like that. So um, we, we probably took too many pictures here, but uh, Chris and I were just really interested in it, the human history of it all and what was still standing um, and framing the shots with just all the neat angles. It's awesome. This is on the road between uh, Valmarie on the north side of the park and going into the park entrance. So there, I just grabbed a couple pictures here, the, the marker, uh, part of the Redcoat Trail area between Wood Mountain and Fort Walsh, which is part of the Cypress Hills area. Um, one of the days we went into Valmarie Kind of wanted to get in, get a little bit of break, uh, see a few buildings and a few trees, that sort of thing. Their museum was closed, unfortunately, but it is in this building here, one of their former school buildings. Um, quite lovely. The other neat thing in Valmarie is they have uh, an online walking tour. So I had downloaded that uh, while I still had internet back home and uh, just kind of played it over my phone and we walked to a handful of different places that had interpretation. So that was kind of cool. 
um, this was the first stop here after after the museum and uh, NHL's Brian Trottier uh, was from Valmarie so they've got this neat sign here with all of the different teams and championships and that sort of thing that uh, he was part of. This was just a vacant lot and I thought it was a neat way to kind of tidy it up and, and keep some interest uh, in between a couple of buildings in uh, downtown area. Uh, their war memorial. You can actually see a few trottiers on there as well. Um, and then they have two historic elevators that are still standing. Uh, this is the older of the two and they've parked a vintage fire truck out front. Uh, one neat thing that they do uh, a couple of times a month in the summer is they actually show films up on the side of this elevator. And I think the one for August that we weren't going to be there for was uh, West Side Story. So uh, that's kind of neat bringing the community together that way. Uh, here's the slightly more modern elevator just beside the other one there. Um, and then this is, I believe, a former convent that has been uh, converted to be almost like an inn or a bed and breakfast. So I grabbed a couple pictures of that as well. And again, just a few little poplars and caragana growing down here. Uh, then after that, we had driven back uh, into the campground again. Um, it was quite a bit cooler here. I think this was on our last day where we spent almost the entire day inside the trailer because it was pushing 40 degrees. It was really, really hot. Um, the wind had actually died down, so it was not refreshing anymore. And this was a walk we took after supper. So uh, we've got some more cactus. Uh, some lovely sagebrush. There were a number of photographers who were out this evening catching pictures of the, the evening birds, which was really cool. Uh, we've got a few little bones that were just randomly scattered around. Uh, this is the edge of the campground and the outside of the, the wide open spot for the bison. Um, the flowers really seemed to show up more in the evening, um, probably because the sun wasn't as harsh and their colors came through a bit more. Um, this one's kind of, I like the cotton candy color of the skies here. And uh, the picture doesn't show it, but there were there were dozens and dozens of birds flying. There were flycatchers and swallows and that sort of thing. It was, it was quite neat hearing the little chirps and watching them dive around and catch the bugs in the air. Uh, again, one of the flowers that just kind of popped up, another bone, cacti, of course. Did have to watch for cacti and go for holes in many places. Uh, this was getting close to the Larson homestead from the other side, from the campground side, uh, something we hadn't seen on the trail. So just a piece of abandoned machinery here. Uh, you can see it's surrounded by uh, crested wheatgrass. And this was something that's not native to the park. It is not a natural species here. It's actually quite invasive, but uh, my understanding is it was planted uh, during the depression years, during the dirty thirties uh, to help with uh, soil erosion. It, they actually have a really large root ball and they help to contain that soil from blowing away. So there's a little piece of it there. Um, I like this part. Somebody clearly had a big become a MacGyver of sorts and they tried to wire a piece back together here. So I wonder what had happened, how it had broken down and if they were actually able to fix it. I believe this is wild bergamot. Uh, again, just kind of beside the road, we walk back on the road from this trail. Um, again, some of the, the river area where it looked like there might have been a forest fire or a grass fire. Uh, not the clearest picture because we were starting to lose the light there. But uh, yeah, just bones all along this, this trail here. Um, piece of a, an old can. This again, getting closer to the homestead again. So I wonder if maybe the lawnmower had kicked this up at some point when they had mown the, the trail. Uh, and this was unexpected. I believe this is a milkweed plant, uh, something that the monarch butterflies go for. Um, and it was huge. It was just over knee high, right on the edge of the road and uh, just looks so out of place and alien here in this dry and crunchy surroundings. It's this big lush leaf plant with a big purple flower. Um, so I had to take a picture of that. And there we are just walking back up to the campground. From grasslands, uh, we went back north a little bit and then headed east again and we stopped at Pontex. We needed to have uh, a meal, have a stretch, that sort of thing. There's a lovely bakery there that does great things. And we met Mo the Plesiosaur. So here is Mo. And uh, Mo is a big sculpture. They had found uh, remains of plesiosaur in the area, or pardon me, I think it has, there it is, the Pontex plesiosaur, there we are, uh, found in the early 90s, I believe. So uh, this is something that uh, has been put up by the side of the road as a roadside attraction. And we had some fun with it. I walked around the one side to get a picture. I'm like, oh my goodness, it looks like he's going to eat our trailer. So then the kids got excited. They thought, oh, let's show the cat. And she doesn't look very pleased. In fact, it looks like my husband might be sacrificing her or something. I'm not sure. Um, please take the cat. Don't eat us. Uh, but we had some fun with the pictures. And she's a very good sport. She's not grouchy at all. And I think she just enjoyed being out in the fresh air and didn't actually understand that a dinosaur was coming to eat her. Anyway, 
Uh, we carried on uh, back east, still in the south though. This is just the eastern side of Assiniboia, just past uh, there. We had stopped for a few groceries and the smoke had set in again. Uh, the haze had, had picked up and, and almost like driving into a cloud. So uh, this is just from the, the vehicle window. It's not the best shot, but uh, you can kind of see how the, the wind turbines disappear there into the distance. And we ended up camping at the Jean-Louis Laguerre campground. It's also a regional park. We had never been there before, just outside of Willow Bunch. So it's a very pretty little park in a river valley. Um, it's a little bit of a tight fit for our trailer. You can see we're kind of snugged right in. Um, but quite a contrast in the day. I took this picture just to show the wall of green uh, in comparison to the, the wall of um, grass and openness. Uh, so we kind of went from one extreme to the other there. Uh, there's a Karen down in the park area here, and it just talks about how Jean-Louis Laguerre uh, was the founder of Willow Bunch. Uh, it settled there in 1880 after 10 years working as a fur trader at Wood Mountain. So um, there's a lot of local history here, and uh, they do celebrate that quite a bit. Um, in addition to a few vintage pieces of playground equipment, which we're always fascinated by for some reason, um, there's a nice little playground there for youth, and it's not very far from a beautiful golf course. Uh, we did the one trail that's kind of in the, the campground area, and we weren't looking for it, but my kids did find uh, one of those, um, uh, well, what's the word? Uh, shoot, it's gone from my head. We, a geocache, there we go, um, where things are hidden around, that sort of thing. So we left a note uh, saying who we were, where we were from, and then we always carry a few little tchotchkes in our trailer that we can leave in these caches if we happen to find them. Sometimes we do purposely go looking for them, but this time we just kind of found it. So they went back the next day and they put in some little spinning tops to say thank you. So um, a little marshy area. Again, it was very, very lush and green. Um, all kinds of trees grow in this ravine. This is a birch tree. There were elm, green ash, poplar, um, almost anything you can imagine except for coniferous trees. So I was impressed with that. I was, again, thinking these are more species we see in central and northern part of the province. Some lovely lichen. Uh, I believe this was a sort of finished bloom of a mint plant. Um, and then the trail kind of takes you from the, the, the valley floor of the campground is scattered amongst these trees. You'd never know it was there. You kind of come up a ravine and then cross back over to this, this lookout point here. So um, quite a lovely view. Again, hazy again, but uh, kind of made the best of it. Way off in the distance here, you can see Willow Bunch. There's the elevator there. And the trail continues on. We didn't have time to go and finish it that day because we got in a little bit late, um, but we did enjoy walking back down. Uh, the next day was our full day there, so we did go into the village. Uh, we'd been there before a few times and, and really enjoyed it. Uh, this is the community centre or the museum uh, in a former convent building, and uh, it's quite a special place uh, because it's also home to this fellow, Edward Beaupre, who was also known as the Willow Bunch Giant. And they've recently fixed up the statue. I think the summer students painted him up and he looks very fresh. Um, this is his memorial stone because he's actually buried here. Uh, there's a plaque from the Saskatchewan History and Folklore Society that tells a little bit about him. Uh, he was born in 1881 right in Willow Bunch there. Uh, he actually passed away because he had a lung hemorrhage that was caused by tuberculosis while he was working for the Ringling Brothers uh, with the circus there, the World Fair. Uh, and he was only 23. Uh, he was eight foot three inches tall. And then it goes on to say that he actually, uh, his mummified body was kept at the University of Montreal until 1989. Uh, later, his body was cremated and the remains were returned to his family in the Willow Bunch area. And he was buried on the museum grounds in 1990. So um, he did come home a little bit late, but uh, he did come home and he's very special to the people of the area. Here is a near life-size picture um, with my children. Now my son is almost six feet tall, not quite, uh, but he's getting there and they still have a ways to go if they want to catch up with Edward Beaupre. There's me with a statue. Um, and the museum has some really fun rooms, uh, definitely a lot of things to look at. This is a picture down one of their hallways, and this is Jean-Louis Laguerre, so we kind of followed him around a little bit. Um, the museum has the giant's room with a lot of artifacts that Edward Beaupre actually used. Uh, I believe this is the settler's room, so a lot of things that the uh, European people and some of the Métis people would have used. Oops, I went too far there. Uh, this is the hospital room, and I believe when the museum was actually first open, they were in a former hospital building, so these are some of the pieces that were saved and brought over to the, the convent when they moved there. Uh, this is the chapel and the school room. I just like the, the reader on the desk, the new we come and go. Uh, this is the First Peoples Room, so there's a display about the Métis and Indigenous people. It's a lovely display. I think this is one of their newer renovations that they've done. Uh, very nice uh, interpretation there. 
This is tools and technology. So we've got some retro televisions and radios. Uh, they do have a small exhibit on the Northwest Mounted Police and the RCMP, former jail cell. Uh, this is the archives room. So they've got a lot of uh, the history of the village in the area, who the settlers were. They've got a really nice photo library of former buildings that no longer exist. And I was just getting fancy because I like that it said Willow Bunch on there. Uh, this is the homemakers room, so lots of cool stuff. They also offered uh, a photo scavenger hunt uh, for the, the youth, so my kids really enjoyed doing that and it helped keep them engaged with what they were looking for and uh, looked at more things probably than they would have otherwise. And some fun hats. I wish I wore more hats. That makes me kind of sad I don't. Um, I'm a button fan, so I had to take a picture of the button jar. And I think that probably means a lot to a lot of folks, remembering grandmothers or their mother's button collection. And I thought these guys were cute all up on the shelf. And I'm a roller skater, lifelong roller skater, so these called my name. Uh, this is also the veterans hallway, so they've done a really nice job on this presentation here down the hall. Um, we walked around the town a little bit afterwards um, and we found this thrift store and I'm always a fan of thrift stores too. So we went in and we found out that it's actually the first building that was built in Willow Bunch and it's still standing. So uh, that's what it looked like then. I'll just flip back quickly. It looks like they've changed the annex off the one side over time, but a lot of the features are still there. So there's a number of these signs you can walk around. Some buildings are still there, some are missing, um, but it is nice to kind of know, you know, what was there uh, before and what wasn't. So. Oh, am I out of pictures here? And I think I'm, ooh, that's really funny. Do, do, do. I feel I had more pictures. Let's see here. Maybe I'm done. That was getting close to the very end anyway. And I see we're almost out of time. So maybe I will end that there anyhow. And I'll stop the share. And hopefully you could all see all of those. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And thanks very much for listening.